Hello, my name is Dan Caldwell, and I'm the Senior Advisor for Concerned Veterans for America. Today, we are honored to be joined by Congressman Peter Meyer from Michigan's 3rd Congressional District for discussion on the latest events in Afghanistan and congressional war powers. Congressman Meyer is a veteran of the Iraq War and also spent time in Afghanistan working for a nonprofit. He's a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and has been very vocal about the need for Congress to reassert its role in shaping America's foreign policy. Congressman Meyer, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, Congressman, I, I think it's important we start off uh, by talking about the latest events in Afghanistan. Um, you've been very vocal in the past about the need to withdraw from our endless wars. We've also been very outspoken about some of the events that have occurred recently in Afghanistan. Uh, Congress in the coming weeks will no doubt be holding hearings on, on what has happened. Um, and one concern that um, I and, and others have is that uh, there will be a focus primarily on the last 20 days, which there needs to be a focus on, but that will be to the exclusion of some of the failures over the last 20 years. Yeah. Do you think it's important that Congress takes a look at the whole war instead of using the last 20 days as a way just to score political points against one party or another so that we can avoid making a lot of the same mistakes that we've made again in future conflicts? Absolutely. Um, you know, this is a failure that has a thousand fathers and we need to make sure that we have an unsparing amount of accountability to your point, not just over the past 20 days, but over the past two decades. I think, the last 20 days really has driven home all of the successive failures, um, strategic, operational, and otherwise, that, that led us to this point. Um, we, you know, I think back, if you were to ask a commander on the ground each year for the past 20 years what the mission was in Afghanistan, you'd get a different answer. And the other sad reality is how disconnected folks have felt from that conflict. And it's understandable that we pay most attention to a conflict when we have American men and women on the ground, uh, when we have you know, soldiers, Marines, sailors, airmen tragically losing their lives. Uh, one thing that really was driven home to me is that you know, we haven't, yes, we've had very low fatalities, tragically up until Thursday. Uh, we've had low fatalities in recent years. But that was by and large because the conflict shifted from one where our military was directly engaging on the ground to one in which we were fighting an air war. Uh, and, and to note, in 2019, we had two consecutive quarters, Q1 and Q2, and then Q2 and Q3. Each quarter had the highest civilian fatality number that we had to date. So even though it looked in the US because we weren't seeing American men and women dying, that does not mean the conflict was not going in a, in a very violent direction. The other thing a lot of folks fail to realize and some of the criticism of the Afghan National Security Forces um, really rings hollow. You know, they, oh, well, they just all abandoned their positions. This, those forces lost 50 to 60,000 individuals in the past five years. I mean, that was in a country of 30 million. I mean, the, if the scale of the fatalities borne by Afghan police, by the Afghan National Army uh, is staggering, absolutely staggering. So, you know, we, we very much, you know, have been navel gazing for a very long time and, and we always look for kind of what our angle is, but I think oftentimes fail to appreciate that the US government um, encourages aids and abets a lot of um, atrocity and a lot of death that again, comes back in, in the form of, of attacks like we saw um, tragically last Thursday at Abbey Gate at Kabul Airport. You know, those, those instances are not isolated. They are part of a much broader conflict that we just kind of zoom in and zoom out of, um, but that quickly leaves our mind. So we need to be looking at all of the past two decades. I mean, with the large focus on Afghanistan, but also the broader war on terror and the Iraq war, you know, how is it that what started off as relatively simple missions, you know, morphed into much more broad engagements. Um, and despite trillions of dollars, despite thousands of American lives, have resulted in just the far worse status quo that we see today. 
Congressman, I think you summed that up very well, and I'm happy to, to hear that um, you're looking at it this way. And, you know, I, I hope that with your role and your voice on this is you can help drive the discussion that way, and I know you will. Um, I want to pivot now to something that's related, but I, I think is part of the reason why we've had some of these failures in Afghanistan over the past 20 years and other conflicts, and that's Congress really neglecting its role in matters of war and peace. I want to start off by talking about some of these outdated authorizations for use of military force uh, that are on the books. And you've been a leader in, in trying to repeal some of these. I want to start off by talking about the 2002 authorization for use of military force, which uh, there's been a vote in the House on a, on a bipartisan basis to repeal this. You were a co-sponsor of, of that bill. And um, there's been a successful vote in the Senate, and there's likely a path for passage of this bill through the Senate and again through the House, and President Biden has said he'll sign it. Uh, there's been criticism of, of the effort to repeal this authorization. Um, and considering some of the events of the last few weeks, do you still think it is the right move to repeal the 2002 authorization for use of military force? And if so, could you explain uh, the reasons that you think it's still appropriate to appeal, repeal it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the 2002 authorization, this was to justify our entrance or to give the legal justification, excuse me, um, for the second Iraq war um, in, in 2003. So it was intended to eliminate threats emanating from Iraq. Now, the way that that was intended when it was written was against Saddam Hussein um, and his regime. Uh, it has been arguably interpreted to also mean other threats coming out of there. Uh, but I think that even that definition has been a bit stretched. And one thing to note is since our forces left in 2011, and I was actually on the ground up until the summer of 2011 as a soldier in Iraq, since that point, uh, the 2002 authorization has not been the operative justification for anything that we've done in that region. Uh, the commander in chief, still retains his Article II self-defense ability. So a lot of the airstrikes that we may have seen against Iranian-backed Shia militants, or um, the, most notably against uh, General Qasem Soleimani, uh, those attacks were not, did not use the 2002 as their primary justification. It was, this was in self-defense. Oh, and by the way, even if it wasn't, we probably could have used this thing as well. So, you know, this is just an example of a bad, authorization that has lived long past its usefulness that we should be clearing off the books because the danger of having these old authorizations out there, even if they're not being used today, is somebody, a future president can creatively interpret that and really cause damage, go around Congress uh, and, and ultimately take the U.S. into military actions that were not intended um, by the individuals who passed the legislation originally, nor you know fit the current intent of Congress. And I know there's some concern that, that this would be weakening our position. Um, the simple response is, hey, we still retain the self-defense capabilities no matter what. I mean, that is enshrined in the Constitution. The president can rapidly respond to an immediate threat. The bigger issue is, well, if something doesn't fall under that, what do we do? You pass a new AUMF. Right? I mean, and if, if you don't have a Congress that approves that, if, if the president is doing something that Congress doesn't approve, then that's the problem, right? We shouldn't have these, these kind of workarounds on the books um, intended to solve a problem, but only creating far, far more new ones. Well, uh, I, I couldn't agree more, Congressman. I, I think that you laid it out very well. Um, you know, hopefully uh, the repeal of the 2002 AUMF will pass. Um, and that they'll kind of start a, a broader examination of some of these other outdated authorizations for use of military force. Speaking of which, um, probably our, our biggest, most overused authorization for military force is the 2001 AUMF, which was passed uh, in the days following the 9-11 terror attacks and was passed to authorize the military to go after those who'd been involved in the attacks, Al-Qaeda, and those like the Taliban that supported uh, Al-Qaeda and, and offered a safe haven for them at the time. However, since then, it's been stretched to be used in 19 countries, including against groups uh, that didn't even exist on 9-11. Um, in addition to repealing the 2002 AUMF, do you think it's time for Congress to take a hard look at repealing the 2001 AUMF? 
Before we talk about the 01, I just want to point out, we also have a 1991 AUMF on the books for the first Gulf War. Um, and my favorite and the piece of legislation I authored was the 1957 AUMF uh, to give President Eisenhower the ability to check communist influence in the Middle East, uh, just in case that was needed. Um, it wasn't needed. We should probably get it off the books. Uh, most members of Congress weren't even born when that thing was passed. But the, the to your point, the 01, the 2001 AUMF passed shortly after 9-11. This has in, underpinned the vast majority of our global conflict, uh, with the exception of the Iraq war. You know, this has been what was used um, obviously for the war in Afghanistan. Uh, it was used for our operations in North Africa, in the Horn of Africa, and other parts of Central Asia and the Middle East. Um, this is a very broadly construed, broadly written, you know, Al-Qaeda and associated forces that then comprise, to your point, groups that weren't even in existence on 9-11, and actually groups that were actively fighting against Al-Qaeda at the time we were targeting them. So it has just been you know, stretched beyond its, its definition. And I, I don't mean to say that those groups shouldn't be targeted in one way, shape, or form, but the oversight that has been applied has been incredibly wanting, right? Imagine how different this war, the war in Afghanistan would have been if every two years, Congress had to have an up or down vote on whether or not to continue, uh, whether or not they affirmed the judgment of the commanders on the ground, whether or not they believed in the mission as it was set forth. And maybe not even just what that would do within Congress to pursue oversight, but how that would force the president and the Department of Defense and the State Department and the intelligence communities to better articulate what it was they were after, to really hone what the intent and what the goal was. Thinking of it a little bit more broadly, you know, if that also included arms export controls, looking at all the weaponry that's fallen into the hands of the Taliban, how much more sense of ownership and concern would Congress have had if both houses had to pass by a majority vote to supply the, uh, the Afghan National Army with helicopters or to supply more advanced weaponry, right? The way Congress has stepped back from this entire picture and, and left it solely in the hands of the president uh, has created not just a sense of, of arrogance and entitlement within the Defense Department that they know best and they can run roughshod over the constitutional checks as envisioned by our founders, but it has also led to the horrific mismanagement that has got us to where we are. I firmly believe we would not have had the catastrophe that we witnessed over the past two and a half weeks in Afghanistan if Congress was more engaged and if the executive branch, if the president was forced to defend, to make that pitch, to, to hone what the argument was going to be, rather than just carrying on with this blind sense of momentum. Congressman, you actually just touched on this a bit in regards to arms sales, but beyond repealing some of these outdated AUMFs, and, and you brought up the 1957 AUMF, which is bizarrely still on the books, the 1991 AUMF, again, which is still on the books. Um, but in addition to arms, uh, better overseeing arms exports. Is there anything else that Congress should be doing in terms of hearings, oversight, appropriations? What are some of your other ideas for, for getting Congress more involved in, in this uh, important matter of, of uh, important matters of war and peace? Yeah, we've really focused on the permissions and, and what that would force from an oversight and, and just kind of intra branch um, collaboration standpoint so that, you know, again, uh, decisions that were being made have to be defended, have to be articulated, have to be argued. Um, th there's an additional component that has been used as a little bit of an end run. And, and this has domestic and international implications as well, but it pertains with emergency powers and, and the way that our presidents have very broad things that they can um, argue for and, and implement in times of crises, whether real or perceived. Um, this gets a, a, a bit more complicated, and I, I should point out the goal is not to completely tie the president's hands. You know, there is a benefit in having an executive who is able to act rapidly in response to a developing crisis. The goal is once that immediate crisis becomes more apparent, once there's an opportunity for oversight to come in, you know, you have a responsibility for the legislative branch to also enter into that equation. So if it's an emergency, 
um, that's going to last more than a set amount of time, whether it's six months or a year, saying, if we're going to continue this, Congress needs to approve it, right? And we understand that there's that need for that immediate response. And some of this was articulated in the War Powers Act. Uh, there's that Im a need for an immediate response. But after that, that moment has passed, if this is going to be enduring, it needs to be justified. So this is not some complete rewriting and, and cutting the knees out from a president, but this is saying that the president should be accountable as our founders intended, should be accountable as the constitution dictates, should be accountable to the most responsive body, which is Congress, specifically the House of Representatives, but. All right. Uh, yes, I don't, I don't think your colleagues in the Senate move with the same sense of urgency as you all, but that, that's all by design. Um, and that's hot, why we hot, have this balance system. Awesome. Yeah. Um, well, well, Congressman, I, I want to thank you for your time today. And I want to thank you for your advocacy on these important issues. Do you have any, any final thoughts? I would just say, um, you know, this is this has obviously been a challenging couple of weeks within the veterans community. Um, you know, as somebody who who worked in Afghanistan, um, you know, it's been waking up to messages, um, you know, going to sleep to messages, trying to get people to safety. You know, I'm incredibly proud of our team. You know, on that front, uh, I think it's important to remember. Um, you know, we still have an obligation to those who put their lives on the line to support the U.S. mission. And, and this is something our team has been actively working on going back, um, going back to April. And, and I think what we have seen in that ensuing time, I mean, if you look at the crushes outside the gates of Kabul airport, uh, there was a bipartisan group of us pounding the table months ago saying, clear this backlog, evacuate the people that we know we need to evacuate. Let's not wait until it's too late. Um, I, am, I, I do not want us to relive the failures of the past several weeks, the past several years, the past two decades. I, I am concerned about what this will do to the country long term, to our divide between civil uh, and military authorities, um, to what we will do to the veterans community. I think we all as a country have an obligation to make sure that we never make the mistakes that were made over these past two decades. We never make those mistakes again, that we learn every lesson we can but more importantly, that we apply those lessons so that we don't have to relearn them down the road. Thank you so much for the work your organization does uh, and for all the attention uh, you have brought to this really critical issue. Congressman, uh, thank you for that. And, and again, thank you for your, your service and advocacy around these issues. And I, I appreciate you taking time out of your vis very busy schedule to join us today and to talk to us. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who've been watching, you can find out more about uh, Concerned Veterans for America at www.cv4a.org or find us on Facebook by searching Concerned Veterans for America or on Twitter at Concerned Vets. Thank you all again for joining us today. Take care.